So we're starting a new unit and for now we're just going to simply call it vector valued functions. So we've been looking at vectors and we've been looking at some new algebra to help us uh, interact with the three-dimensional world. So what we've got here is um, a function and let's do a little quick reminder of what that means, so, sort of a shorthand. You know, for every input, there is only one output. Okay, so something gets substituted in, one answer comes out. One answer comes out. So, let, let me show you what a vector valued function might look like and then we're going to do sort of a little uh, minor pre-calculus review of uh, what that might mean for us to get started with. So for a definition R of T and I'm going to use the component form of the notation, but my students know that I accept linear algebra form. I also accept the IJK form that many of their physics professors want them to use. But this takes a little bit less space when I'm writing it, so I'm going to use it right now. So the first component is some function of t, and the second component is some function of t and if there are three or more components then there would be functions for those as well. Here would be sort of a common notation not the only notation possible for defining this. So let me just uh, point out to you what that means is as the input is t. The output is a vector. The input is t, the output is a vector. So we're going to substitute the value t. That vector for this class purposes will have either two or three components to it. So you don't need to have any deep insights or inspiration for where this is going yet, but I will tell you, you actually have seen this math before, but in a completely different type of vehicle. Um, like the automobile has changed radically over the last 130 or so years. This is going to be a totally different uh, way of looking at um, something else that should have been in your before calculus history. So let's just do a quick little mini review. When we studied functions what kind of questions were you asked about? What types of questions typically went along with functions before you got to calculus? Let me add that little uh, caveat in there. So you might have been asked to substitute values, plug in you know, so you, you might find like f of 2, for example, for example. Let's see what else is on our list. Maybe you were asked to graph a function. We'll be getting to graphing very soon. That's either, uh, it's, it's rather a significant aspect of what we're going to be considering here. Another question that's common to functions when you first get started would be to list out, well, what types of inputs can there be? Are there any inputs that cause this to be undefined? And then the same thing is true for studying, like, what kind of outputs are we going to get? Um, the terms for that were domain and range. So we're going to start with an example of domain. I would say this is more important for some fields of study than others. If you are a computer 
programmer, if you're programming uh, computers, you need to be aware that there could be un undefined values that are input in and you have to be able to, uh, to, whoever the user is inputting information needs to be at least warned that they're inputting incorrect information. Domain's a rather big deal to consider. So, if I do an example of domain find or state the domain of the following and let's make this natural log of t 1 over t minus 6 Sometimes we think about domain with a picture, but in this case we're going to use our knowledge of some basic functions. There are so many ways to state or list a domain out. I'm just going to approach it in a simple fashion just to get the minds working. But there's interval notation. You can use a number line. You can use any quality expressions. There's formal uh, set notation for defining domains. And each instructor professor you have and each job you have will have different types of notation that you're going to have to focus on. So I will not fight that battle in this little video. But I will tell you that the natural log function, the natural log t function, t must be positive. There are no uh, real values for natural log of a negative or natural log of zero. And for 1 over t minus 6, what do we know about that? Well, that's right. t cannot equal 6. So for our domain, we need to just find a way to uh, state it without um, doing overkill. Maybe we could say it like this. Um, t is greater than 0, but t is not equal to 6. That's a little bit basic, but I'm willing to um, accept that. If you like number lines, there's a great way to do this on a number line, but even number lines have different notations with them. But for purposes of what I'm going to introduce now, let me just say, all right, so you just need to make sure that t is positive and that 6 is also not input into this mess. Okay, let me show you one other type of, we'll call it pre-calculus idea related to functions. Okay. There we go. My focus was off. All right. R of t equals t minus 1 quantity squared 2 minus t and we are going to look at a graph. We're going to look at, at a graph of this. Okay, graph. Now for this instance or this use I'm not going to use graph paper. I'm going to just uh, put a sketch here. But in our next segment, I'm going to come back to this and we're going to look at this particular function a little bit more closely. So let me just give you uh, one other piece of information. Let's graph given that t is greater than or equal to zero. And I think if I were in my classroom, I would probably tell you about how many points I would recommend plotting. Plot at least three points, plot at least four or five points. I'll I would choose one of those. So before we look at how to do this, question mark, how do we go about doing that? Um, let's just look at it from a not calculus standpoint. When we were first in pre-algebra, we substituted values. And we just found out what we got when we plugged in the value. So if t is 0, the x component zero minus one is negative one, square is positive one, it's one. And two minus zero is two. 
And if I were to be on regular graph paper, I could maybe make this a little bit prettier, but I don't think this is going to be terrible. Now, please note, this is a vector. It is not a point. So this is a vector. But the unusual thing about vector valued functions is this vector valued function here. Um, we're going to treat it as plotting points. We're going to treat it as plotting points. So I'm going to put a point at 1, 2. If t is 1, this is going to become 0. 2 minus 1 is 1. I will plot a point at 0, 1. If t is 2, 2 minus 1 is 1. 1 squared is still 1. 2 minus 2 is 0. That point would be at 1, 0. You should know if I were in a before calculus class, I might even say this isn't a function. The problem is the definition of function is that for every input there's one output. T is the input, not X. So for every time, oops, I gave something away, for every time value, there's only one point that comes out of it. 3, 3 minus 1 is 2, 2 squared is 4, 2 minus 3 is negative 1, and let's just go a little bit further with this here. 2, 3, 4, negative 1. And remember the two aspects of a vector, the direction and the magnitude. What's different about this is we must show a direction. Sometimes that's not easy to do on paper with the drawing, but if I assign it, I'm going to make sure that you can indicate the direction. It's going to continue on and you might even recognize that this is a parabola. But we begin here our journey. This is our starting point and we continue in this direction. I don't necessarily need you to label the starting point if you've made a table but if you don't make a table, then I need you to tell me the starting point. Do not go this way because that happens before time is zero. This is the part of the graph where time is zero. Now we're going to do more with this concept in the upcoming segments. So this is just the beginning. This is the before there was calculus. What could we do with this particular type of problem? Vector valued functions. Okay, till next time.